just give you a brief background on Juvenile Law Center. Um, you may have heard of us. We are a nonprofit public interest law firm here in Philadelphia, but we work across the Commonwealth and across the country, advocating for rights, dignity, equity, and opportunity for young people who are involved in the justice systems or the child welfare system. And we have been working with Education Law Center and our youth advocates advocating for Act 1 to be passed for a very long time. We'll tell you about that. But first, I'll let Maura just make sure you know what Education Law Center is. So the Education Law Center of Pennsylvania is a nonprofit legal advocacy organization. Our focus is ensuring that all children across the Commonwealth have access to a quality public education. We do this work by focusing on students who are most marginalized, children living in poverty, children of color, children who are English learners, those in the foster care juvenile justice systems, those who identify as LBGTQ, et cetera. Our strategic areas are equal access to quality schools, adequate and equitable school funding, and dismantling the school to prison pipeline. Next slide. Thanks. Thanks, Maura. Jay, would you please launch the poll results so we know who we have with us today? I see 95 participants. All right, so, um, oh, I think a lot of attorneys, actually we're hitting on folks from a variety of different roles, which is great to see. Um, obviously there's a need to know about Act 1, whether you're the one charged with implementing it or you're directly supporting a young person who would be eligible, et cetera. So thank you so much. And we're also gonna hold on to that, as I said before, so that we know um, which uh, groups of stakeholders we need to continue to uh, reach out to and make sure everyone's aware of the provisions of Act 1. All right. So just a brief history about this very, positive law that we are excited about. Um, hold on, let me make sure I can see my own slides. All right, whoops. So it was a long time to get here. We've been working on this for a very long time. Um, I started at Juvenile Law Center in 2009. Um, Maura and my colleagues at Juvenile Law Center were already starting to work advocating for this bill. And it's because of the number of young people whom we had spoken with who mentioned that they had had to change schools because of their involvement in the foster care system, juvenile justice system, or due to experiencing homelessness, and all of the barriers that arose uh, as a result of those school changes and structural issues. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Juvenile Law Center's youth advocacy groups, youth uh, fostering change, you may know them, they are now called Advocates Transforming Youth Systems. And the group that used to be called Juveniles for Justice is now called Advocates for Youth Justice. Both of those groups were instrumental in getting this law passed. They published a guide called Operation Education, which includes both personal stories and a number of policy recommendations around school reentry issues. And they met with lawmakers in Harrisburg and their staff and um, really were very instrumental in galvanizing the forward movement of this bill. We also want to thank Senator Langerholk and Senator Brown and their staff for championing this legislation as well, which is now law. The Governor Wolf signed this into law in January, and it is already in effect. It was in effect last school year, and it is certainly in effect now. And some of you may have joined us in our spring webinar. We will be sharing some of that same information, but also some things we've been able to learn over the summer as the Pennsylvania Department of Education has issued ad additional guidance and application materials. Um, and before we give you specifics breaking down each one of these things, so don't worry, you will get more details on all of this, just wanted to provide a general overview. So as I said, we had heard for over a decade directly from young people from the advocates with whom they worked, from school personnel, from our youth advocates, um, that they had experienced a number of barriers when they were changing schools due to involvement in these systems or to, due to experiencing homelessness. These were barriers not because they didn't want to learn or they didn't want to go to school, but because there were infrastructure issues that were preventing them from making a smooth transition. So this bill aims to address those by putting into place some processes and a point of contact, something you'll hear a lot about, um, to try to make all of this go more smoothly and make sure the youth is welcomed and fully integrated into the new school and able to make 
progress towards timely graduation. So it assigns a point of contact. That's an actual person, a building level person who will be working with the youth to help this transition happen. happen. There is the bill necessitates an uh, assessment and an awarding of both full and partial credits for prior coursework. This was one of the things we heard time and again that young people were not getting full credit for the academic work that they had completed um, either in placement or because they were changing schools before uh, the term was over or records were lost, et cetera. So making sure that you get academic credit for the work they completed is very important. And this bill requires that to happen. If a youth is still behind in credits, the bill, uh, the law requires that the school entity have um, consider waiving courses as well as providing makeup opportunities that can still keep the youth on track towards graduation. And if a young person is still unable to get a diploma from their school where they currently are attending, there are diploma options that the bill creates. Um, so you'll hear more about that, that provide additional pathways to graduation. The bill, the and I keep saying the bill, but it's a law. It's in effect now. We talked about it as a bill for so long, and now it's really a statute and it it needs to be followed. So pardon me for saying a bill so much, but the law also aims to promote equal access to educational opportunities. It eliminates all fines and fees that would otherwise be assessed against the student. We know those can be extremely harmful to young people and their families. Um, and it also ensures that young people are able to participate in extracurricular opportunities um, and other types of programming that they would otherwise be eligible for and not be excluded from those opportunities simply because they change schools in the middle of the year or what have you. And I will now pass it to Maura. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, those, the, those are really the fundamental um, underpinning of this law. So important to ensure engagement and equal access of these particularly, uh, this particular group of students who are often marginalized as well as uh, access to a timely uh, diploma. So uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education released its formal guidance just this past August, on August 1st, 2022. This specifies what schools need to do to both identify children who are Act One eligible and their duties to support eligible students. And it discusses in particular that students who may have attended school last school year may not have known about this law. So school districts, school entities need to proactively identify those students and ensure that they receive support to graduate, um, even if they're no longer in school, and to ensure that they have access to extracurriculars, are not, do not have fines and fees, et cetera, even if they were eligible last year. So the law requires credit verification, graduation planning done by that point of contact under Act I, um, and identification of a timely path to graduation for ninth through 12th graders. Again, Act I applies to all children that's kindergarten through 12th grade, and there are additional uh, requirements with regard to students ninth through 12th in terms of graduation planning. Uh, you need to provide information about how to support students who may have qualifying disabilities or be students with IEPs. And it reaffirms that Act I works in concert with all these other civil rights laws, including the McKinney-Vento Act, the um, IDEA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, et cetera. It doesn't undermine any of those rights, um, but in fact, it works in concert with them. Next slide. So there is a Dear Colleague letter that was issued in April of 2022. That will be provided to every to all the participants. There's a link in this PowerPoint to both the Dear Colleague letter as well as to the guidance that was issued by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. That Dear Colleague letter as well as the guidance, um, which is called a Basic Education Circular, available on PDE's website, apprises school entities of their obligations a last school year as well as this school year. Next slide. And the highlights from the Dear Colleague letter are important. School entities are encouraged to provide Act One services and protections broadly 
and without requiring the student to produce eligibility evidence. So there's no specific requirement that you have written documentation, et cetera. This, uh, it's very, very important that eligibility can be proved in a number of, of different manners and that that is a flexible standard. It explains that Act 1 helps to facilitate equal access to schools, so eliminating barriers to participating in sports teams, extracurricular activities, eliminates fines and fees that would otherwise apply to this cohort of students with regard to a variety of fines that we'll talk about. It eliminates graduation barriers that are associated with lost or unrecognized credits or students' inability to take a course required at the last school. And that's a lot of the work of the point of contact for the ninth through 12th grade student cohort to ensure that you have considered all partial, all full credits that could be awarded, and that you've also waived requirements that are not required under state law. Points of guidance, uh, points of contact should be building level people with the responsibility to ensure completion of all tasks. So ensuring that they have the ability to really provide that support to all Act One students, building that individualized graduation plan, ensuring that policies are in place, et cetera. And the Keystone Diploma is the statewide diploma that is absolutely new under Act One. Um, it has just become available for this 2022-23 school year, but it can be awarded retroactively under a uh, new law that was passed in June to ensure that students who were eligible last year have access to that statewide diploma, even if they are no longer in school this school year. Next slide. So who is responsible? What's the definition of a school entity? It is all school districts across the Commonwealth. It's all charter schools, all cyber schools, intermediate units, many of which run different programs, um, sometimes for students with disabilities, as well as alternative education for disruptive youth programs. It also applies to career and technical schools. All of these school entities must provide school-based supports for students who experience, quote, education instability, and the law defines what that means. Education instability due to homelessness, involvement in the foster care system, um, or the juvenile justice system. Next slide. And Maura, before we move on to the next slide, I had forgotten to say at the beginning that we are hoping to address all questions at the end. Please put them in the question and answer box and we will get to as many as we can. Thanks, Kate. So student eligibility, what is education instability or education disruption? It applies to all students grades K through 12 with certain additional provisions applying only to ninth through 12. They experience one or more school changes during a single school year, period. That's what the law says, that is who is included under Act One due to experiencing homelessness, involvement in the child welfare system, involvement in the juvenile justice system, or voluntary placement or custody agreement. So all of those students would qualify under Act One. Um, and a student may be attending school in a variety of settings. That's important. It applies to children who are in residential placements, children who may be returning to a former school, students who are starting a new school or re-engaging in school after an extended absence. And that's in the basic education circular guidance from PDE. Next slide. So what are the duties and responsibilities of school entities under the new law? Number one, they have to assign an individual building level, uh, if that's preferable, point of contact to all eligible students to support youth to graduate and support youth to ensure equal access to school. Number two, develop policies to ensure equal access to educational and non-educational activities. So eliminating fines and fees for children who are Act 1 eligible, for example. Number three, define how full and partial credits will be assigned, assessed and count towards graduation. This may require a school entity to adopt a new school policy to talk about how partial credits will be assessed, um, how they will count towards graduation, how credits may be waived under Act One, 
or there may be alternative assessment or ways to ensure that a child meets the criteria. There could be projects, it could be um, a different, you know, if a child had taken a class in uh, 12th grade, 12th grade English, 11th grade English, but didn't complete 9th grade English, there is an assumption that that child has still um, has the competency to have completed that ninth grade course. Next, determine if a student cannot graduate from their current school, whether they might be el eligible to graduate from a prior school. So if they can't meet the local graduation requirements and those local graduation requirements are not waived or assessed in a different manner, determine if that student is able to graduate under the graduation requirements of any other prior school that that student attended. And finally, if a student cannot graduate from their current school or from a prior school, determine whether the child should apply for, that child should automatically apply for a Keystone Diploma. That's the statewide uh, diploma made available by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. The new application is now on the website to apply for that statewide Keystone Diploma. And if they can't graduate from the current or prior school, the point of contact must ensure and provide support for that child to complete that application to see if they can graduate through the Keystone Diploma. Next slide. So ways to determine Act 1 eligibility. Uh, remember, we're trying to be very, very flexible. We want to provide support to all eligible students. And in addition, there's absolutely no prohibition against applying Act 1 more broadly to students who may not be explicitly named in the law. Some school districts are already applying this new law to children who are migrant students, immigrant students, students who may have stayed in the same school but have many absences due to homelessness, et cetera. So it's important to think about who could benefit from this law. School entities are flexible in determining this eligibility. It could be through a letter, through email, a verbal communication is acceptable or any other documentation, something confirmed through caseworker, shelter provider, or the person who a student lives with if they're in a doubled up situation, for example. Schools must keep the eligibility information completely confidential. That's essential to all these students. And parent guardians and students maintain the choice regarding what information they share with the school entity. It does not direct that additional information must be shared to determine Act 1 eligibility. Next slide. So what is a point of contact? It's a district or preferably building level person that is designated by the school entity. And that information should be memorialized on the student's education records. So it becomes a part of their education records. The point of contact worked in concert with key players to review the records to ensure appropriate placement. When a child K through 12 comes into a new school, make sure they're in the appropriate classes, connect the students with educational mental health services, additional programs that they might benefit from K through 12. Also for grades nine through 12, create that student specific graduation plan. They would be the people assessing student credits full credits and partial credits, also determining what coursework might be, uh, what they might demonstrate competency in, in another way, or what credits might be waived, and would connect the student to credit recovery programs if they needed that. Next slide. So points of contact must immediately request the student's education records. That includes special education documents from all schools that a student has attended. Have those conversations with the parent, for example, if the child is IDEA eligible, so children, a child with, a, with disabilities, talk to them, talk to the caseworker who should have the education records about what is in that IEP even prior to receiving that IEP. Ensure that students are appropriately placed in the right courses and the right grade. Facilitate mid-year extracurricular uh, participation. Even if the child comes mid-year, all of these students are eligible to participate in sports teams, even if they were not around to actually uh, 
you know, try out for the sports team, try out for the play. They should have access to that. And the law says that all fees, fines must be waived that would otherwise be assessed against the student. That includes uniform fees, that includes um, activity fees, et cetera. And connect students to a school counselor or dental health professionals as appropriate and with the student's consent to make sure they have the support they need while in school. Next slide. So I am going to turn this over to my wonderful colleague, uh, Paige Jokey. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Maura, so much for setting the table and for Kate for leading us off and to Jay for helping us get kicked off. Um, first, and note on fees, Maura already mentioned a few of the fees that are present, but importantly, the Pennsylvania Department of Education has recognized in the Act One Basic Education Circular, the BEC, um, the fees are harmful and they create barriers to full participation in school. And so Act 1 requires all fees that would be assessed against eligible students to be waived. Full stop. There is no income requirement. Schools have a duty to proactively waive these fees and it should be made clear in policy so families aren't left wondering. There are many, many different ways that fines and fees can come up. In fact, across the Commonwealth, there are close to 4,000 types of fees that students can experience at school, which is something that we're quite alarmed about at the Education Law Center and other organizations as well. But some of those things that are mentioned specifically in Act One, again, if it's a fee and it would be assessed, it needs to be waived. So here's a non-exhaustive non list of those. School ID fees, uniform fees, fees for courses, extracurriculars, school-sponsored activities and field trips, if there are school lunch or library fees, fees for summer school, credit recovery, and graduation and graduation regalia. So if you're supporting a young person who will be walking, please make sure that they do have regalia and that that is assessed before the day of. Next slide, please, Kate. Thank you. So I see one of the questions um, in chat was about ninth through 12th graders. So this is part of that information. School entities, as Maura mentioned, must honor all previously earned full and partial credits. So schools need to investigate whether or not a course was completed at a different name at a prior school that meets the same types of requirements that their new school would have. So for example, we see this a lot where a student may take a course called Mythology One at a prior school, and it is actually English One. So something that I find to be very helpful is write out a list of all the schools with the students so they can tell you about what they were learning. If points of contacts have questions about what the material was, you should contact the point of contact for the prior school in order to make sure that the student is correctly getting credit for all of their hard work. If a course isn't going to be afforded credit, schools have the op opportunity to waive courses needed for graduation. If a student has can, can already completed similar coursework like I just talked about, or if they can demonstrate competency in a particular content area. And I'll get more into that in just a second. But either way, if a course is not waived, the school must provide an alternative or modified course of study to ensure that the student can finish on time. So that does not include a summer program after graduation has happened. It means that that young person needs to be given a timely opportunity to graduate. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in terms of the partial credit policy, if schools do not already have a policy, they must develop one and implement it to ensure that young people are getting full or partial credit for all work they have satisfactorily completed at all prior school entities. So when awarding partial credit, it must it is very important that students receive credit, even if they leave before a marking period. What we know with supporting young people who have experienced educational instability is oftentimes their moves do not happen at places where schools would be given credit already. So it's important to go back and ensure that um, people are getting credit. And I'll also give you a hypothetical and example in just a second. So one way schools could do this is to combine the total number of periods where a young person was able to attend, including any periods they weren't able to attend due to school-based barriers, extended absences, enrollment delays, tech barriers, transportation barriers, and then divide this number by the total number of periods. We also recommend that schools round to the nearest 2.5 credit hour and consider the best interest of the student when making credit decisions. We make this recommendation because sometimes schools have a good intention behind their partial credit policy, but it ends up with things like students 
being awarded 0.33 credits multiple times, and then they can never earn a full credit, and that can pose barriers to graduation. And Kate, if you wouldn't mind the next slide. So here's one example about a student, Nico. They are forced to change schools mid-year and they're Act 1 eligible. They attended 23 periods of science at a prior school, and there's an enrollment delay which causes them to miss five periods of science when it's a new school. So under our recommendation, NICO must be awarded partial credit for the work in science one that they completed at their prior school. That is required by the law. And the recommendation for how to do that is that they attended 23 periods at the prior school. Five periods were missed due to transportation barriers. So we're looking at 28 periods total. If you can see on the matrix on the left side of your screen, you would see that that would result in two credit hours. So that is one example about how schools can make sure that partial credits are fully counted. And you'll see here our example has everything rounded to the nearest 0.25 credit hour. Next slide, please, Kate. Thank you. And so if you're not awarding, so after all credits have been calculated from all prior school entities, both full and partial, if a course is not there, the school can either waive it, it can waive the course needed if dem common street, if dev if the student can demonstrate competency in the content area, excuse me, and schools have very broad discretion about how they can determine whether or not a young person has demonstrated competency. And some of the ways that could happen are completion of a project, a test, a presentation, a series of assignments, a conversation. One good way to do this is to speak with the young person and talk about how they can do that. You can also look, as Maura mentioned before, that a student has already completed a higher level course. So for example, if a student is in and has passed Algebra 2, but there is no record of Algebra 1, they are able to do that material. So you could award credit after the student was able to demonstrate competency by successfully completing that class. In addition, you could look to something like an experiential learning opportunity, an internship, or career in technical education to have credit for a student after they're able to demonstrate competency. Next slide, please. So there are several pathways to on-time graduation afforded through Act 1. So the ideal is allowing a student to graduate and walk with their current school. However, if after considering waivers of classes and makeup options, if that's not possible for that student to graduate from their current school, so the school they're attending now, the point of contact for their current school should reach out to the prior school's point of contact to see if they would issue a diploma because the student may meet a prior school's graduation requirements. Importantly here, it may be a prior school that the student has attended two or three schools back, but they might be willing to issue a diploma. And as a last resort, after exhausting the current school and prior school, beginning this school year, a student with the help of the point of contact may apply for the statewide Keystone diploma if they meet those requirements. And I'll get more into that in just a moment, but just as a note for now, these are valid high school diplomas. They are not a GED and they have the same force as a district issued diploma. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in order to determine a pathway to graduation, school entities must give all Act 1 eligible 9th through 12th graders an individualized and student specific graduation plan that allows them timely graduation. So a best practice for this is ensuring that the student and the parent or guardian or EDM is consulted in when the graduation plan is created and has a voice in that process. Obviously, the young person's education, they are the most impacted, and so their input should be considered as the plan is developed and it unfolds. The law is clear about what things must be included. It must specify the courses needed to graduate and transition to post-secondary education or the workforce and determine how the student will graduate after all full and partial credits are counted, courses are waived, and alternative courses of study are considered. And so in this process, again, you would look first to the current school, if not a prior school, and if none of these are possible, then supporting the student in applying for the Keystone Diploma. And the point of contact, contact information needs to be on the graduation plan, so if folks have questions, they can refer back to that person. Next slide, please. So importantly, graduation can now be re retroactive to last school year. So if a student was not identified or not afforded a pathway to on-time graduation last school year, they can be graduated now in this school year. So the 2022-2023 school year, 
without completing any additional requirements or attending classes through Act 1, school entities have a legal obligation to proactively reach out to these young people and students who are unable to take the 2020 Keystone exams due to COVID-19 must not be penalized and must be still offered a pathway to timely graduation. And so if you are supporting a student to whom this applies, their diploma can be retroactively dated to last school year, which is the 2021-2022 school year. I see a question um, in the chat that just came up about points of contact, and we're hopeful that there will be a directory in the near future. Next slide, please. So now, speaking of students who are people with disabilities, so students with IEPs and 504 plans, as was mentioned before, all special education laws still apply. Importantly, students are still able to graduate either by credit accrual, so earning credits, or by completion of IEP goals. And they're still able to remain in school until age 21, even if Act 1 offers a pathway to graduation earlier. So full stop, Act 1 does not abridge any important um, special education laws or rights a student might have. And just to know if a student is going to remain in school, but their class is graduating, they can walk with their class and that's considered to be best practice. Schools under Act 1 must follow students' IEPs and students are still entitled to a free, appropriate public education of faith and must be educated in the least restrictive environment. So it, schools are not allowed to impose additional restrictions on these students. Next slide, please. So um, Act 158, which deals with Keystone exams and new graduation requirements. So this is a statewide law um, that changes the way the graduation requirements are enacted. So beginning this school year, 2022-2023, every graduate must successfully complete one of the following pathways, Keystone proficiency, Keystone deposit, composite, career and technical education, CTE concentrator, alternative assessment, which is determined at the local level or evidence-based. And that is a pathway that can be considered if a student does not meet other um, one of the other options. Next slide, please. So the long way to Keystone Diploma, you'll see a screenshot to your right. This is what the application looks like. PDE has issued an online application, which again should be used as a last resort if graduation from the current or prior school isn't possible and should be done with the support of the point of contact. They have the full weight of district issued diplomas and PDE is already engaging in many efforts um, with state and community colleges and industries to ensure that they are aware that this is a diploma that has full force. The Keystone Diploma becomes a part of a student's permanent record and is maintained by the last school that the student attended. And the Pennsylvania Department of Education, PDE, will also record and maintain a list of students that were awarded Keystone Diplomas and they will be categorized um, as having received the Keystone Diploma. We will have those numbers. Next slide, please. And um, I will close with some tips for supporting students and then turn it back to Kate for some fabulous resources that we hope will be helpful to everybody on this call. So in terms of supporting young people for timely graduation, make sure that a credit assessment is done and that the school entities has policies and clear directives for assessing partial credits and waiving locally required course requirements. It's really important that this gets done correctly the first time. I know in my experience, I had a student once who was told she would need to repeat high school just because all of the credits weren't recorded the first time. So when you're working with young people, have them make a list of where they attended and when and make sure everything gets counted. If you need to help folks understand what the requirements under Act 1 are, rely on the Act 1 basic education circular and the Dear Colleague letter to help school entities understand their obligations and ensure that students are always involved in all discussions and planning related to their graduation and get to know their point of contact. And importantly, it is also best practice that young people maintain um, connection and the points of contact are proactive in seeking connection with young people throughout the time that they're Act 1 eligible to ensure that they have access to graduation planning and any bumps in the road can be smoothed out. And Kate, I turn it over to you for some resources. Thanks, Paige and Maura. 
Um, so we have a few slides of resources here because we wanted to highlight for you things that you can turn to both the official guidance as well as to tools that Education Law Center, Juvenile Law Center, and other partners have created already to help implement Act One. Um, this is also something that we are continuing to roll out. And if you have questions where you think a tool would be useful, please do reach out to us and we would like to be responsive to that to the extent we can or work with other stakeholders to work on implementation of Act One. Um, so first I wanna highlight several tools that Education Law Center created that are self-advocacy tools where you can use these to request a number of the protections that are um, given to you by Act One. So um, hold on, my mouse is being very funny as you may have noticed earlier in this presentation. So I can't um, move aside something here. All right, so you can request an assignment of point of contact, a credit assessment, participating in extracurricular activities, eliminating fines and fees, um, or a graduation um, for the past school year. And the benefit of having these tools is if you're feeling like maybe the school entity doesn't know about Act One yet, or you're not sure how to really describe how the um, you know, act puts that protection into place, you can rely on these tools to make your case even stronger. Um, Education Law Center, uh, Juvenile Law Center, and our partners at the American Bar Association Center on Children and the Law have also put together a checklist for point of contacts. And uh, the youth advocacy groups that I highlighted earlier, Advocates for Youth Justice and Advocates Transforming Youth Systems, also put together based on their own experiences, tips and best practices for points of contact. So certainly, if you are a point of contact, I would recommend checking out both of these tip sheets. Please, if you work with points of contact, pass these along. But I also want to highlight them for folks who are not themselves a point of contact or working even within the school entity because you can make use them yourself as kind of a way to make sure that the point of contact who is supporting the young person that you're supporting is doing what they're supposed to be doing and providing support to them because it's a new role and um, everyone is learning and wants to be doing the best for young people who are eligible under Act One. Um, and there is a general fact sheet about Act One that Education Law Center created. Um, in response to questions that we've been getting at presentations like this, we've also put together uh, frequently asked questions that appears on the Juvenile Law Center website. We will at some point be updating that based on questions we continue to receive today or at future presentations. Um, so that's a place where you can continue to go and make sure you have um, you know, an ad additional point of view about the requirements of Act One. Um, and then here we have both the Dear Colleague letter that was described at the beginning that came out last spring, as well as the final PDE basin edu Basic Education Circular. That's the official guidance that came out over the summer about Act One. And of course, Act One itself, which is useful to read as well. It's not the world's longest law. And you can see very clearly the way that it lays out the different options and protections for young people. And if you're interested in how we got to this point or in thinking about policy issues more globally, um, I encourage you to check out both Operation Education, which is the guide that the youth advocates put together that gave policy recommendations that really did directly lead to the passage of Act One. Um, Education Law Center, Juvenile Law Center, Southern Poverty Law Center, and uh, uh, the Justice Juvenile Justice Policy Lab at Drexel University also have a national report specifically looking at cred academic credit in the juvenile justice system. Um, and so there are some additional examples to look at there if you're interested in um, developing policies more globally. And now we are going to turn to the question portion of our webinar. So please continue to put any questions that you have occur to you right now in the Q&A box, and we will do our best in the next 15 minutes to get through as many as we can. Um, so one question that came in is whether the issuance of a Keystone Diploma counts for or against an LEA's graduation, graduation rate and what is the rationale if it doesn't count? 
Um, Paige or Mora, would either of you like to take the first response on that? Um, I'm happy to take that one. So um, under the new PIMS guidance, if you are graduating through the Keystone Diploma, it does not count towards your graduation rate. The rationale behind this is to ensure that students are graduating through their local requirements, through their local districts, and really using the Keystone Diploma as a last resort. It does not um, implicate any negative, there's no negative connotation in terms of a dropout rate, but, there, but it is not counted towards your graduation rate. And that is the reason for it. It is, you know, there is an incentive to how students graduate through local requirements rather than graduate through the Keystone Diploma. And that was a decision that was made by the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So you'll see it on the coding. It's coded differently than uh, someone who graduated from the your local school district or from a prior school district. Thanks, Maura. Um... And I'll flag also, there was a question earlier about what does a point of contact do that came up before we had a slide on points of contact. If that person feels like there are additional questions, please feel free to write in so that we can further elaborate. Um, the next question was asking us to go back to the slide, which I can try to find now, on the provisions that only apply to high school grades, grades 9 to 12. So I'm going to try to pull that up. Um, here we go. I think Paige covered that one, if Paige wants to add anything. Sure, I can take folks through the refresher. Thank you, um, Maura and Kate. So important things for ninth through 12th graders are ensuring that there is a graduation plan. So getting all of those records, identifying what courses are still needed, which courses will be waived, and if they're not waived, an alternative pathway provided for on-time graduation. Um, young people should not have any surprises. They should be able to look at that plan and know this is the class I'm in, these are the courses I need to graduate. And then also that point of contact is responsible for ensuring that that young person has a pathway to graduation and it's on time. So when you're thinking about those pathways, again, the order is current school, prior school, as a last resort Keystone Diploma. And if you are exercising Keystone Diploma, the point of contact should be filling out that application. And of course, these roles are in addition to ensuring that students have equal access to extracurriculars, that all fees ordinarily assessed have been waived and that they aren't facing barriers to full participation at school. Hope that helps. And it's our hope soon we'll have a resource to show you what a sample graduation plan will be. And in the meantime, I think the points of contact um, checklist and guide from um, the youth advocates are also still relevant to this question as well and making sure that points of contact are fulfilling their obligations and best supporting young people in the upper grades. Um, we also had a question about Act 151 that came in before um, Paige addressed Act 151. So I'm going to assume that that has also been covered. But again, if the people have additional questions about Act 151, please write those in. So uh, I think that was referring to Act 158. Oh, that's what, I'm sorry, Act 158. Thank you, Maura. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to address that one because I don't know if we addressed it directly. Um, I'm actually going to put in the chat a fact sheet that Education Law Center did about Act 158 and the various pathways. There's something called an evidence-based pathway, which may be an option to graduate through um, Act under Act 158. Essentially, there's nothing that says that this supersedes those state graduation requirements. It is expected that students are complying with statewide graduation requirements. However, two things to note. Number one is that there are several different pathways. It isn't just proficiency on all the Keystone exams or even that composite score, but there are other options. Um, and the evidence-based includes doing it through an internship and different pathways. There's also something called alternative assessments so that if a child takes the SATs, that that's another way that they can uh, fulfill that requirement. In addition, um, Pennsylvania 22 PA code section 4.5 subsection D 
talks about children who experience extenuating circumstances that a chief administrative officer, that would be a superintendent, can on a case-by-case -case basis waive um, high school graduation requirements. So that's something that was in effect before, and it's something that continues to be in effect, not only for children who fall within the purview of Act One, but for, for children who experience a number of extenuating circumstances, moving in the 12th grade for other reasons, um, having ex extended absences for a period of time, et cetera. But it's very explicit about sort of the, the how that is waived. So I just wanted to highlight both of those. Thanks. Thank you, Maura. And um, can you specifically address the fact that homelessness is not listed in the superintendent waiver? The question asker is, uh, adding, asking it for additional clarification. Sure. In terms of the waiver under the Pennsylvania school code, it actually references that it could be due to extenuating circumstances, and it uses the word including. It doesn't prohibit um, homelessness or other extenuating circumstances. It simply gives some examples, and it has the litany in there, which I can pull up in a minute. Um, so it does talk about including serious illness, death in the immediate family, family emergency, frequent transfers in schools or transfers from out of state in grade 12. So those are all just examples, but it's not an exhaustive list. Thank you. Thank you. Another question back to points of contact. Do all schools have points of contact now or are they still implementing that part? I can take that one. So Act 1 was in effect last school year. So schools at that point had a legal obligation to identify points of contact, preferably at the building level for young people. What we know is that many schools are doing this. They're applying Act 1 broadly and expansively to serve students who um, could benefit from Act 1. And we also know that points of contact may not be in place for every student. So the legal obligation is active. And it is our hope that we will soon have a directory so it can be easy to know who this is for the young person. If you're not sure and you think an Act One point of contact needs to be assigned, please refer to our self-advocacy tools because we do have um, a letter that you can use for the school. And if you are a point of contact, which I saw a few folks were, so thank you for all that you're doing to support students in real time. There is a fancy flow chart which sort of walks through what should happen. So if you're supporting a young person who hasn't been connected, that flow chart could be useful in determining what the next steps would be. Thank you, Paige. There are no open questions, but we'll give it another few minutes to see if anyone wants to write in with any final questions before we log off today. And again, thank you all so much. We are, as we said, very excited about Act One, and we're glad that so many of you have joined us with your precious time to learn more about this so that you can support young people and spread the word because it is still a relatively new act. As Paige said, there are some school entities that may not be fully aware yet, and so um, making sure that you're educating yourself and others is obviously very important. And um, we will, again, share the recording and the slides, uh, as well as any the links to the written materials that we've referenced uh, in the coming days.